grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. I want to stay right in the vein of what's already been said and what's already happening. I didn't sleep good last night. I very rarely do I ever have nights like I had last night, and usually when that happens, I know it's the Lord. Uh, I'm not that spiritual of a person to say that all the time, but the Lord began to speak to my heart about this. On the subject of worship, if you are saved, child of God, you belong to Him. One of the most powerful things at your disposal is the ability to worship. We use the word worship a lot. We call it worship services, a worship team, a worship leader. In the churches across America today, there's very, very little real, authentic worship that takes place. And I would like to say, by way of introduction, that worship is not something that only happens on Sundays. That was, that was pretty weak. I said worship's not something that happens only on Sundays. If the only time you have a season of worship in your life is on a Sunday, you are missing out on the real joy of being a Christian. I want us to look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 20 and verse number 20. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, it's on the screen for you. Judah is in a massive battle with many adversaries or enemies. Look what the Bible says in verse number 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah. And ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, watch this, believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so ye shall prosper. So shall ye prosper. Watch verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, And that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, (laughs) Praise the Lord! Oh, yeah. And that should praise the beauty of holiness and they went out before the army and say, Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. So y'all get this. The king has just set up... I feel like preaching already. The king has just set up a team and said, you got one job, and that is to walk around saying, praise the Lord, his mercy endureth forever. Could you imagine, hey, hey, what's your job around here? Praise the Lord, his mercy endureth forever. I wish some of y'all would learn how to do a little bit of that. You would enjoy church a lot more if you quit watching and you started participating. He sets up these people that say, Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, watch this, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, 
which were, which were come against Judah and they were smitten. The people of Judah, they haven't lifted a sword. They haven't swung a fist. They haven't thrown a javel. <laughs> All they've done is said, Praise the Lord. His mercy endureth forever. And when they got to praising God, then the Lord goes down into the camp and sets ambushments against all the enemies. Verse 24, And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off from themselves more than they could carry away and they were three days in gathering of the spoil it was so much I want to preach on this subject quickly today that worship is my weapon did y'all hear me? worship is my weapon you can be seated. Probably much of this flowed into my heart from watching Mindy worship through her mother's funeral yesterday. But God directed me to this text within the Bible where God's people did nothing but worship. And their worship became a weapon. May I tell you today that if you're saved, if the Holy Ghost is living on the inside of you, we have access to this supernatural thing called worship that is not a service. It is not a group of people. It is not a place. It is a position of your heart. And worship is our weapon. The Bible says in Psalm 100 and verse 4, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. John 4 and 23 said, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Hebrews 13 and 15 said, By Him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Psalm chapter number 22 and verse 3 lets us know that God inhabits the praises of His people. There is something powerful, there is something supernatural that occurs when a bunch of nobodies like you and I who are the children of the Most High God that we don't come to church to impress or be impressed. We don't come to church to find out who's worshiping or who ain't worshiping. We don't come to church to find out who's dressed the best or who's dressed the least. We don't come to church to find out who's there and who ain't there, but we come with a mindset to worship. And the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of His people. That means when you worship God, listen, heaven is a place of perpetual and continual and constant worship and praise. Is it not? In heaven they are saying, Holy, 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 holy. 
is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The angels are worshiping day and night and night and day all around the throne. Those of you that have lost loved ones that were saved by grace, they're worshiping now. It is consistent and constant praise and worship going to God. And when you and I on this side of eternity, when you and I on this side of heaven engage and trust the Word of God, and even when we don't feel like worshiping even when we don't think we can worship even if we don't know how to worship that means that when we worship our God on this side we invite his presence into the room and into your circumstances and a little bit of what's in heaven comes down to earth because you choose to have a heart of worship and a heart of praise I'm here to tell you it's not a charismatic thing it's not a Baptist thing it's not a Pentecostal thing or a Methodist thing this is a Bible thing, ladies and gentlemen. And every now and then, it ought to be so real to you that you get caught up in where God brought you from. You get caught up in where you used to be and how you used to live and where your life was headed. But then you look at where you are. You look at the goodness of God. You look at a roof over your head. You look at shoes on your feet. You look at clothes on your back. You think about salvation that lives in your soul. And every now and then on the world, of days you ought to be able to rise up throw your hands in the air and let it roll off of your lips that God has been good to me and say God thank you I worship you in spite of how I feel in spite of what I think in spite of what I see I worship you you're the creator God you spoke everything into existence you are here before I got here you're here while I'm here you'll be here after I'm gone I worship you I give you praise I give you glory. And the Bible says when we worship him, heaven pays attention. Now, all you real good Baptists, listen to me. That don't mean you got to do it like I do it. If you did, we'd all be in the ER by 2 o'clock. Nowhere here does it say you got to do it like the preacher does. Uh... My wife is a tad bit more Presbyterian than I am. If Becky throws that hand up here, you know it's on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> Becky's not going to throw her leg kick, and she's not going to yet. And she may one day. Who knows? I don't know. But, but this is about all you're going to get out of Becky. Some of y'all come from different backgrounds. You have different personalities. I understand the makeup and the workup and the way God made us all individually and uniquely. Some are shy, some are timid. I'm not here to say you got to yell it and scream it and holler it like other people do. But there ought to be something from your heart to the ears of God that says, thank you. You're holy. There is something about real, authentic worship. I'm going to give you three things about it, and I'm going to take my seat, and we're going to be done early today. Number one, praise kills the enemy inside of us. How many of y'all know your greatest enemy is not external? Y'all, come on now. Your greatest enemy is not external. Your greatest enemy is internal the greatest enemy I have is the enemy in me worship kills the enemy that is on the inside I got to run with you for just a second when you study the law of first mention with the Bible and you study the subject of praise you go back to Genesis chapter number 29 in second Chronicles we're talking about a nation named Judah but when we go to Genesis 29 we start talking about a person named Judah and within the life of Judah the birth of Judah we find the very first mention there of praise and it is centered around the story where there were two wives how many of y'all know two wives would kill a man somebody say amen <laughs> he worked seven years for this wife only to have the wedding day expected to wake up and see Rachel but instead Leah huh. 
How do we say this nicely? Uh, Leah had fell out the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. That's, that's, the, that's the North Augusta version of what the Bible's trying to say. She was not the prettiest thing in the family. He was not after her. He was after the sister. But the father gives him Leah. He's got work seven more years. He goes and gets Rachel. All this stuff happens. Well, Rachel is barren. Can't have no kids. Leah comes along. And Leah knows he doesn't love me like he loves her. And as you read the text in, in, in Genesis 29, you, you, I ain't got time to go through it all, but you'll find where she starts having babies. And with every baby she would have, she would name it and she would say this, maybe now my husband will love me. She would have another baby and say, maybe now he'll care for me or consider me or love me. Over and over and over with every baby born recorded in your Bible, with the baby born, she would make a statement of something like, based upon the name of the baby, maybe now my husband will love me. I assume based on the fact that she keeps saying it after every child that he has yet to show her the love that she's looking for. Let's use words like validation. Let's use words like fulfillment. Where she thinks and is saying in her mind, well, if, if I give him this, then eventually he'll finally love me. It goes deeper than that. And if he finally loves me, then eventually I will feel fulfilled on the inside. Do you know how many people live miserable trying to find their peace, joy, happiness, and validation from other people? They have faced rejection their entire life. They know what it's like to feel like they're the last person to get picked to put on the team. And they think, man, if I could just get married, I'd be fulfilled. If I could just get that, if, if my boss would just see in me what I see in me and what my mama saw in me and gave me that promotion, then, of, then I know I would be fulfilled. I've lived long enough, counseled long enough, talked to those same people that thought that that money would fulfill them, that that marriage would fulfill them. That that promotion would fulfill them. Only to climb to the top of that ladder and find it to be just as empty as it was at the bottom of the ladder. You cannot ever be fulfilled by what other people think about you. By what other people see in you. All of us were born with a void on the inside of our heart. That we try to fill with everything in this world to make us happy. Some of you in this room have father wounds. And you were never able or not able to please your dad or make, make, make you feel like that you're successful in the eyes of your father. And now everything's skewed and everything's minced up and mixed up uh, because you have tried to find your validation and the approval of somebody you sought for it very much so. What if I told you that you will never find that peace, happiness, or joy, validation, peace, or approval through somebody else. You say, why are you talking about this when it comes to praise? Because in Genesis chapter number 29, go to point number one, guys, uh, on the screen for me. She goes through and she starts having these kids. And it was four or five different kids she had. And everyone, maybe now he'll love me. But when we come down to Genesis chapter number 29 and verse 35, there is a shift in the mindset of her. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, she don't say, maybe now he'll love me. Maybe now I've done enough. No, 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 no. Now... I've been so disappointed looking this way. I've been so empty looking this way that this time 
I'm not looking this way for my approval or peace. I'm looking this way for my approval and peace. She says, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. Worship will kill the enemy of insecurity that lives on the inside of you. Worship will kill the enemy of jealousy and pride and arrogance and all those things that live and dwell and swell up on the inside. They take over. Somebody can't even have a real conversation with you because you get offended at everything people say. Because what you hear and what you perceive is clouded by your insecurity. Nobody can correct you. Your boss can't correct you without you throwing a three-month temper tantrum. I'm going to preach to the choir. <laughs> Nobody can say anything about your performance because you're so bound up looking for that approval of other people, thinking if you just had their approval, you'd finally be happy. You're never going to find that validation in or through other people. It can only be found through your relationship with Jesus. And a spirit of worship will eradicate and kill and destroy the enemies that are on the inside that are keeping you from going to the next level. Because when you're letting those enemies live on the inside of you, you have become your own worst enemy. You blame everybody else for every circumstance that comes into your life when really you have an enemy on the inside of you that is defeating you on every corner and you're tripping over your own two feet. But God gave us worship. And it is in that worship that I find out and God lifts me above the cares of this world. And I, in the middle of worship, I'm able to say, I don't care who they think I am. I now know who he says that I am. I, they may think I'm a nobody. They may think I'm a nothing. They may think I'm worthless. They, they may not see any value in me. But when I worship and I find out that my God says that I'm a child of God, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a part of the family of God, I have an inheritance waiting for me on the other side. When I find out that the Word of God says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, I find the only validation and approval I really need is not in them but it is in him and you better watch out for the child of God that finds their validation in him they'll walk right through the middle of a war zone and know that they're not going to die a moment before God's ready for them to die they'll walk through every obstacle every trouble and every trial and know if God be for me who can be against me you got to know there's a spirit of worship that you need to, to kill the, the, the enemies that are on the inside of you Mm. Number two, praise kills the enemy, not only inside of us, in front of us. I love this text in 2 Chronicles 2. And they rose early in the morning, went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went forth, Josaphat stood and said, Hear me, old Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so ye shall be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And he went uh, he had consulted with the people. He appointed singers unto the Lord and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord, for His mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Worship not only will kill the enemies on the inside, Worship, y'all don't believe me, but I'm telling you it's the truth. Worship has the ability for God to go in front of you and to destroy the enemy before you ever get there. Yeah. David had to say it like this, the battle's not mine. I'm giving it to you, Lord, it's thine. It is either your battle or it's God's battle, but it can't be both. Did you hear me? It's either your battle or it's God's battle, but it can't be both. 
But when we come to a place and we realize this ain't my battle. Lord, I'm in your will. I'm walking and living where you said for me to walk and live. So, Lord, I'm giving you this battle. And I'm going to do what Moses did. I'm going to go to the top of the mountain. And I'm going to get my hands in the air. And, Lord, you're going to fight the battle. You're going to win the battle. Because when we assume a spirit and a position of worship, God goes and fights the battle for us. I have seen time after time after time where the enemy, the devil, the flesh, and the world looked at the people of God that were going through troubles and trials and heartaches and pressures and turbulence only for the child of God that the devil thought, man, they finally going to quit now. They're going to curse the name of God and die. They're going to give up. They're going to quit going to church. They're, they're, they're surely all this pressure mounting. They're never going to stick in this fight. They're never going to stay in this. Only for the people of God to rise up with resurrection power on the inside. And when they didn't think they could walk another mile, when they didn't think they could take another step, that child of God comes up in the house of God and lifts that hand of praise unto God. God and says, Lord, you've been faithful. Thank you for carrying me through my valleys. Thank you for walking me through the desert. Thank you for supplying every need. And in the middle of God's people beginning to praise God and worship God, there is something supernatural that is unleashed for the people of God as God fights our battles for you and for me. The devil may have some power, but God has all power. And the most healthy thing for your marriage is for you to learn even when I don't see a way through it and when I don't know how how God can work it out, I'm going to keep worshiping anyhow. Even when that child or that prodigal son or prodigal daughter is wandering away, the only position we can really do is, God, that's your child, not mine. Lord, you gave them to me and the best I know how to do, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. I'll be a positive influence. I'll be a gospel witness. But all I know how to really do is accept the position of worship. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. And you may feel like it's a waste of time, but worship is never a waste of time. There's never been a moment that's been wasted with worship because when you and I worship it defeats and kills the enemy in front of us let me ask you a question what is the enemy in your life today that is in front of you that you think man if God would just remove that I would have peace like no other what is that situation in your life right now that makes you cry when nothing else does? That you think, my God, if the Lord would just remove that and take it away, I'd finally have peace. The truth is, one of the reasons it's still a giant in your life is because you're the one still trying to fight it in your life. And if we're honest, when we're trying to fight the battle... We don't even make it better. We make it worse. No. Anybody else ever had family issues? Some of y'all looking at the carpet. It's still the same color. Where you didn't have a clue how God was going to do that. And all we can do is worship and watch God put the pieces back together. God. Second huh. Chronicles 20. I don't see any other way you look at it. He said, hey, singers, y'all do your thing. Said everybody, get everybody in their places. This is, this is what we're going to do. And when God seen them worshiping, he released his provision and he went and confused all the enemies and they started fighting each other and killing each other. Maybe, just maybe, it's time for you to start worshiping again. Maybe, just maybe, it's time for heaven to hear from you again. Even if you just do what they did. Praise the Lord. Your mercy endures forever. Maybe you're a quiet, quaint, godly lady. You say, I don't ever, I'm never going to say it like you. Well, just say, praise the Lord. 
your mercy endureth forever. My dad taught us when we was little kids, he would, he, he would try to get us to shout and say amen. He said, for all you bashful people, go in the bathroom and flush the toilet. And at the exact same moment you flush the toilet, say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Nobody will ever hear you. And you may feel crazy at first, but there's power attached to your praise. Praise kills the enemy that is in front of us. And then lastly, praise kills the enemy that binds us. There is no way in looking at this text in 2 Chronicles 20 where the people of God have the ability to win that battle. Therefore, we see the dependence of King Jehoshaphat on the Lord. We're not even going to try to fight in our own power, our own strength. We're going to worship Him and give Him praise and give Him glory because we know that there is power attached to when we worship God. What binds you? What's got you chained what has you rendered powerless to move forward into the future of your life? Could I tell you that worship provides the keys that unlocks the shackles to let you go free? Anybody besides the preacher ever felt spiritually that you walked into church like you was chained up? And you wanted to worship. And you wanted to be free. And you wanted to experience joy. But something of this world had you bound up. Only to find the choir gets to singing. And the Lord starts moving. And by faith you raise a hand. And a spirit of worship lets the bondage follow. I love Ch Acts chapter number 16. In the word of God, you ain't got to turn there. But Paul and Silas are in prison for preaching. They're in prison for living godly. They're in prison for doing what God's called them to do. And they're in the midst of this dark, gloomy dungeon. And Paul and Silas begin to pray and sing praises unto God. Imagine being the people that's in that jail and Paul and Silas go to singing and praising God and praying inside that jail cell. And all of a sudden, as they got to singing and praising God, your Bible said that the earth began to shake and the prison walls fell down and the shackles that were on their hands and their feet fell off. Because there was power attached to their praise. I've sat through services like this and heard preachers exhort, teach on worship, and I wanted to, but I just couldn't figure out how to. Was dead on the inside. Grief, trouble, trials, cloudiness in life. I wanted the joy of the Lord. I wanted to worship. But I was so dead on the inside I didn't know how. And I would be a fool to think that everybody in this room is walking and living in the joy of the Lord in your every life. What do you do when you know you need to worship? But you can't even find the road to turn on to start worshiping. What do you do when you know you need the joy of the Lord back in your life, but you can't find the words to say? Musicians are coming. I'm, I'm done. 3.30, 4 o'clock this morning, I was thinking through all of this. and I was thinking about the funeral yesterday, and I was thinking about all kinds of different families within our church that's struggling with grief and troubles and I thought about Becky and her mama uh, going to heaven years ago. and I can't testify for a lot of people, but I, I can testify to how God's worked in my life and in my family. 
I know when Miss Carol died, moments after that, I watched a darkness come over my wife, Becky. And I remember the devil being very loud in my life. I got you, boy. What good's a CT and Becky without a Becky? Becky, don't throw rocks at her. She didn't want to come to church. She would say out loud, I don't even know what I believe about this anymore. Why and how would God take my mama like he did? She got sick. Two weeks later, we buried her. We didn't even know she had cancer. It happened that fast. Becky's joy disappeared. She was mad at God, mad at church, wounded deeply. And to be honest, if she's to tell the truth, she still carries some of that, just like many of you do. Preacher Brown always used to say some things you don't ever get over, some things you just do your best to get through. We lived... Two years or more with that dark cloud hanging over our house. Steve remarried, moved out of town, started pastoring another church. I was just starting in evangelism some. And Steve called me one day. I was going to go preach in North Carolina. He said, hey, I woke up this morning and God gave me something, a, a verse to tell Becky. I said, well, Steve, she'd love to see her daddy. Just come on. Spend some time with her. I went off to preach and really forgot about all of it. And never forget, I was living over in that trailer over by the camp meeting ground in the staff house. And I come around that little old corner, going back into that bedroom. It's probably 2 o'clock in the morning, expecting the lights to be out and Becky be asleep. But Richard, instead, I come around the curve and the light was on in our room Becky was sitting up in the bed with a Bible on her lap and a bunch of tissues all over the bed I walked in I said baby what are you doing awake she was weepy she said come sit down and let me tell you what happened tonight she said daddy came over we spent some time together we went and ate, we came home, we laughed. Steve Hurt, he has the ability to make you laugh even when you don't want to laugh. I know he did a great job last week. Um, said, and Dad was about to leave. And she said, I could see Dad's chin start to quiver. A tear run down his cheeks. He said, baby, I woke up this morning and was reading my Bible and the Holy Ghost gave me a verse that I'm supposed to give to you said it was the very verse that your mama claimed and trusted when she was trying to get pregnant with you years ago. said, you have lived in this dark cloud of depression for one day too long. Steve looked at Becky and said, you were born to be a worshiper. And the devil has robbed you of that. Your joy is gone. Your peace is gone. And you got to get it back. She said, Daddy, I want it back. I just, I don't even have a clue of how. He said, well, honey, here's the verse that God gave me for you. And I want everybody to listen intently to this. In the midst of her dark season of grief, Steve said, honey, the Bible says, in all things... Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I said, what happened? She said, I got so mad. She said, anger rose up in me like I hadn't felt in a long time. She said, Daddy, are you telling me that not only did God take my mama from me, but now he's going to require me to say thank you for taking my mama? I said, Steve said, no, baby, that's not what that verse says. That verse says, 
in all things give thanks. Since somewhere in the middle of all this, you've lost your worship. You've lost your shout. You've lost your praise. And the only way you can get it back is in all things. Baby, somewhere in the middle of this, you've got to find something to thank Him for. You've got to find something to praise Him about. You've got to find something to worship Him over. Steve's version of the story, he said, when I said that, Becky folded them stubborn arms. I said, Daddy, I can't. Steve said, well, I know God sent me here. I'm going to get on my knees, and if i got to pray five minutes, five hours, or whatever it takes, Daddy's not leaving until we get some victory in your heart. She said, Steve got down beside that couch and started praying and calling on the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and started calling out on God, asking God to help her. And Becky said, I stood there thinking, well, he can pray all night long. I can't lie. God knows I'd be lying. What am I going to be thankful for? My heart's broken a million pieces. How can I thank God for any of this? Said, Daddy kept praying and kept praying and kept praying. She said, and CT, I don't know how long it was, but after a while, Daddy praying, she said, the hair, the, 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 goosebumps come up on the back of my neck she said I hadn't felt the presence of God in so long I couldn't even remember she said but in that moment I could feel the presence of God come in that little place where we were and she said in that moment my stubborn arms folded and she said it was as if the Holy Ghost whispered in my ear the exact prayer that I needed to pray and she said I got down there beside my daddy on the couch and she said this is what I said God thank you for 21 years with the best mama in the whole wide world. That may sound, <laughs> woo, that may sound small, that may sound insignificant, that may sound a tiny, but in the ears of God, God inhabits the praises of his people, and God heard one of his children and the distress call from another world, and with that one little bitty praise that rose up into heaven, Becky said in that moment, she says as if the Holy Ghost gave her moment after moment and memory after memory of a mama that taught her how to sing, of a mama that raised her in the house of God, of a mama that sung songs with her, and she said, every memory that come through my mind, I gave God praise for it. I gave God credit for it. I thank God. She said, before I knew it, me and daddy was having church in the house, worshiping God and thanking God, and she started crying, and she said, CT, I don't know what it's going to be like in the morning. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but God set me free. I felt like the Holy Ghost ripped those cords of bitterness and rip those cords of hardness off of my heart and she said honey God heard our prayer God set me free I come to tell somebody that's shackled up I come to tell somebody that's bound up I come to tell somebody that feels like you can't walk another mile lift your voice raise your voice lift your hands give God glory give God praise give God thanks God will set you free I'm going to ask them girls to come back. They're going to sing that same song again. And I'm going to do like Jehoshaphat did. I'm going to say, where's my singers? Come on. Where's my singers at? Y'all got one job for the next little bit. Y'all don't even need no help. Y'all's pros. Y'all got this. I didn't tell y'all to go back here. Get your microphones. Come out here. Get your microphones. Come on. I'm going to give y'all a job. Y'all stand right here. And y'all got one job. You listening to me? You got one job for the next few minutes, and that's to give God glory. Because, Maddie, God's been good to you. God's been good to you. God's been good and faithful. Y'all got one job, and that's to praise the Lord with your voices and sing. Praise the Lord. His mercy endureth forever. And y'all got one job. Can y'all say praise the Lord? One, two, three. God hears that. Yeah. If it worked in the Bible, it'll work today. They're going to sing. 
Some of y'all got icicles on you because it's been so long since you praised God. I'm going to ask you to shake off those baptistic rituals that you got laying on you. Shake off the opinions of what you fear of other people thinking. I want you to shake off uh, the fact that well, I, I, I was hurt in another church. I was this, I was that. I want you to forget about all of that. And I want you to very quickly scan over your life and find that every step of the way, God has been there when nobody else could. And you ain't got to do it like I do it. But I don't want nobody to leave this room without either, whether on an altar, whether in a whisper, or whether in a shout. You say, praise the Lord. Your mercy has endured forever in my life. And I want to thank you and I want to worship you. And if you'll just take that one little step by faith, watch if the Holy Ghost won't give you other memories yes. and other things to praise Him for. I want them to sing. God will kill the enemies on the inside of you. He'll defeat the enemies in front of you. And He'll break off what's got you under bondage. Sing, girls. I love you, Lord, These altars are open. You find a place. Use your seat where you are. Me. Follow God. All my days I've been held.
Somebody praise the Lord for this place. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. I know I, I mainly preached to the church today to save people. But if you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you'd go to heaven when you die, I'll be one of the last people to leave this building today. I would love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You come find me. I'd be thrilled and thankful to help you today. God's dealing with your heart. He ain't going to stop. Might as well come to him. He'll save you. For the rest of you, I hope that this is not one of those messages that you just hear and leave and go eat, but I hope tomorrow at home, before you go to work, you'll be a worshiper. Tuesday, you'll be a worshiper. Wednesday, be a worshiper. And watch God let the shackles fall off of you. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in your house today. Thank you for how you've met with us. Thank you for how you've moved. Thank you for the burdens that were laid down on this altar. Thank you for the hearts that were helped and encouraged. I pray, God, you continue to work, move, help, restore. And Lord, we pray that this church would be full of worshipers that find that worship is our weapon. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said.